And that's what Sam, when she, if she's 50 bucks a month for, tw for 29 years at 60, she's got that number. Now, the other interesting thing is that's at 10%. It's, it's actually higher. Yeah, 89,100, by the way. And we could say, well, but most of us aren't going to retire at that age. So say it's 65. So instead of 29 years, we went to 34 years. We can play the same game, hit calculate, 147,000. So you're talking an additional six, $7,000 that's going to get you an extra 50,000. So that's compounding interest. It's a pretty powerful thing. And even if we were to go just for the sake of argument, we said, okay, she's going to retire at 67 instead of 65. You had two extra years, 1200 extra dollars to 179,000. So again, you're adding 25 ish thousand dollars to your scenario by just spending two more years, a total of 2,400. Most of us would trade $2,400 for 25,000. We would like that. So anyway, um, so that's, that's kind of a, a quick summary. So what I want to show us is what does inflation look like? Now, we all went through the last three years, three and a half years, pretty strong, high inflation. The last year, we're down to what they're saying is not only about 3% now. The Fed wants to get it down to two. But when we went up some 28 to 32% in a three-year period, that, that last 3% still hurts. So what happens when you have inflation? So this is showing $200,000 at a 3% annual inflation, 20 years into that, your $200,000 buys $108,000 of stuff. Inflation is a real thing. I don't wanna dwell on that, just kinda of wanna illustrate. Compounding interest is the other side. So this is an illustration of 6%, which is the market's done way better than 6% over the long haul, over every category. However, this works a nice, you know, just a nice illustration. If you did have $5,000 put in every year at 6%, in 30 years, you got $400,000. Um, pretty, pretty powerful to reverse inflation and compound on the positive side. And you always want to try to make sure that when you're investing, you're doing things that can outpace inflation, because otherwise you've just got the same purchasing power you started with. But over time, it's a very powerful opportunity. At the bottom of the screen there, you see where it says rule of 72. So that's just a math thing. Divide by the rate of return. If we were using that 10% figure that I punched in the investor.gov, at 10%, that means your money is going to double in every 7.2 years. Just a simple math. Rule of 72, how quick is my money going to double? What rate do I think I can get? What rate am I getting? If I have all my money at the bank and I'm getting 0.2% interest, it's going to take 10,000 years. That's probably an exaggeration. But um, when, you, when you have assets that can keep up or exceed inflation, you're talking about, it's a simple math equation to say how much, how long will it take for me to double my amount of money? Now, this kind of gets us into, now we're kind of, when we start choosing investments, your goal for your investment matters. And then you, you see the various things people do. People save money for retirement. They save money to send kids through college or send themselves back to school. And, and then you got the special things that go on in life. I want to buy a car. I want to buy a house. I want to buy a boat, whatever it is. And those types of things will modify the investments you choose. Obviously, as it says, the longer your goal, the more aggressive you can be. Because statistically, it's a numbers game. As far as if you stay in the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, the NASDAQ, it doesn't really matter what stripe of the investment world you're in the space of or what indicator you're following. At 15 years, nobody loses money. So if you have a goal and you're in a broad-based investment selection, if you have a goal at 15 years, you're going to retire in 15 years, buy a house in 15 years, you want that money invested because statistically you will not lose, you will win. And then it's just a matter of how big or how small you're going to win. So just again, very quick, very quick background. Um, once you start figuring out what you, what your goals are, as far as am I buying a house or am I retiring when I'm 65, whatever the goal is, you start saying, now what's my personality? Am I a person who is an at-risk personality or a person who really wants to just see not much volatility? I just want to see it climb real slow. And I don't care that I don't make as much in the long run. I just, I can't watch it go up and down. So those, those risk tolerances will modify greatly what you're invested in. And this is the spread of stuff. Treasury bills. First, you got bank. Bank is actually below there. Your savings account, that sits right there at the bottom green line because there's not much earning, but there's no real risk there because you're FDIC insured up to a quarter of a million dollars. 
but then you move up. Treasury bills is second. Now, treasury bills is, is actually where you think of nine month and shorter treasury bills. That's where you've heard the term money market at the bank. I don't want to dwell on that this evening. Uh, being your own bank is something we can do another time if you want. But understand that short term treasury bills right now, they're yielding four and a half, five percent, something like that. So in the money market space, sometimes banks will give you a little more yield than just a savings account. Then you move into the CD space. CDs, again, are most typically, not always, but most typically, banks are going to issue them as FDIC insured, no risk of loss, but you're locking those down for a period of time. And depend, right now, short-term CDs, you can see them get up to about 5.3, 5.4%. You go out a year or two or three and they start dropping because everyone's expecting the interest rates to go down. So the banks are not willing to pay you long-term more than they're willing to pay you short-term. Uh, government bonds are going to be just kind of very clearly, it's when you're loaning money to a government entity. Think of a, a city or potentially a city-sponsored utility department or, or a state. There are going to be, uh, uh, that's a loan to that organization. They're paying you that back. That's a bond. There's a bond document. The bond document says, here's the rules. If something were to go badly and the city goes under and can't afford to pay, who gets paid how much and when? That's what the bond document lays out but you're effectively loaning money to a government entity. Above that in risk is the corporate bond. Now you think in, in terms of, I'm loaning money to Walmart. Uh, they wanna build 23 new stores. They're issuing their debt, which means you're gonna make them a loan and they're gonna give you the rules under which they're gonna pay you what percent over what period of time. That's a corporate bond. Uh, the next level up in risk is gonna be a preferred stock, which is, when a company will issue a stock, it has a little bit of volatility, but, but basically they're saying, we're going to pay you a dividend, a significant dividend, three, four, five, six, seven percent. And yeah, the stock price fluctuates a little, um, but it's basically you're loaning a company that kind of thing through owning a piece of their personal, private, preferred stock. It's a higher grade of stock, so lower risk. Then you have common stock. Uh, common stock is what everyone trades. When you talk about New York Stock Exchange, Everyone knows the common stock world, preferred stocks a little less common for people to know about. But, you know, again, you can buy Walmart, you can buy Amazon, you can buy anything you want out there that is publicly traded. That's a common stock. And that's what you see most of being traded on the open markets. Beyond that, you have options and futures. Again, that's a much deeper, much more complicated discussion. But I'll abbreviate it this way. When you're trading an option, you are buying the right to buy, buying the right to sell, selling the right to buy or selling the right to sell. If you think that sounds confusing, it's just the beginning. And very few people get into that space, um, but it's high risk, high reward, and you can lose your shirt and lose everything, or you can make a bunch really quick, uh, super high risk. So those are the, the basically, that's the ladder of risk in the investment world. Um, and, and so the more risk you take, fundamentally, the more opportunity you have for growth or loss. And that's just how the investment world works. So what we've just talked through, so you've got cash and cash alternatives. Um, that's your banking and bank replacement money. Uh, what, what, what you do to use a bank and when do you want to replace the bank and make yourself the bank. Uh, bonds, again, that's that ownership. Stock is ownership. Uh, other investments, Matt's going to touch on some of the other things people do. And then mutual funds. And mutual funds can fit all of those previous categories. You can have a mutual fund that covers each one of those other categories, but instead of owning one bond, the, the, the city of Olathe, you own that bond, or you can buy a mutual fund of bonds that's gonna own 57 different bonds. Well, the more you own, the more diversified you are, greater opportunity to not lose everything if one investment goes bad. But if one investment goes good, you probably have the highest potential for yield there. So that's so a fund can do all those different things. It's just going to give you immediate diversification. And this is an important thing. A lot of times people don't realize. They'll say, well, what does what is my 401k earn? If you have, if you invest in an IRA, what's your IRA earn? So a 401k is a is a plan. It doesn't tell you how much it earns. It just says that's the structure the company uses to invest assets. What you invest inside that asset that's what you're going to earn. Same thing is true of an IRA. Those are both terms that are, that are a tax wrapper or a tax label around what you're investing in. So I could have an IRA and you could have an IRA and I could have a whole bunch of tech and healthcare in it and be really aggressive. And you could have bonds and really low risk stuff in yours. 
And what that IRA earns is gonna be based on what you poured in that cup or inside that label, that wrapper. Um, and you may already have known all that. If you didn't, great, you learned something. So in the risk space, just understand cash. Actually, cash is pretty important right now. It's been 35, 40 years since we've seen cash be this valuable to people. Um, you can put money in cash holdings and earn very legitimate money. Um, if you go to your bank, you've got a savings account. You can ask them about their money market account. Some money markets, you know, they might pay you one, two, three percent instead of that 0.2 percent on a savings account. Um, personally, when where we work professionally, we're we're working with some assets. People are in the cash space getting about five, five point three percent. So again, that's when you want to decide what to do with your cash. But that's the lowest risk and lowest reward category. Um, and, and so obviously. You know, the plus is it's safe, minus is you can't earn as much and you, you may not keep up with inflation. Uh, depends on where you've, where you've laid your resources. So just again, a little quick summary there, cash alternatives. Bonds are the next step up. And so, yeah, you can have a, a bond, which is a loan to a city. You can loan money to a company. You can loan money to a high quality company or a high risk co company. So if you loaned to Walmart money, you know, they're pretty reliable. Now, if the guy down the street opens a business and he's releasing stock or he's releasing a bond, he says, I want to borrow money. And, and his business is called Billy Joe Jim Bob's Diesel Fried Chicken. You may not want to buy that one. He's If you're going to, you need to make sure he's paying you 11, 12, 13% because he's probably going under. He's probably going to default. But if he doesn't, you've made a high risk loan. You need to make high risk reward. So again, uh, and bonds can be traded. So people will buy and sell a trade um, and they, they can buy and sell a bond just like a stock. I, you don't want the loan anymore. You don't want the interest. You're willing to sell that. If the interest rate's high, I might pay you more for it. If it's interest rates low, I might not pay as much for it, but then I might buy that loan from you. So you can trade those. So they have a little fluctuation in value because people trade them. And if you want it more than me, you're willing to pay more than me. So they're traded on the open market. So they do fluctuate in value. Um, so the different types, U.S. government securities, that's going to be your treasury bills, treasury notes, agency bonds. That's think of Fr Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, that kind of thing. Uh, municipals, that's obviously cities, corporate bonds, that's into your businesses. Um, and so when you have a bond, that bond document says what they're going to pay you. You know what you're going to make. You don't know if that bond's going to exist or if they're going to default, but you know what, if they're long are around, you know what you're making. That's one of the benefits. Um, and it doesn't always correlate to the stock market. Now in 2022, it did. There was a specific reason why. Inflation was so high, bonds were not beating inflation. So they were devalued. They, wasn't, they weren't worth having. They weren't even keeping up with inflation. So they tanked with the rest of the market. And that can happen. It's very unusual, but it can happen. It's the one time in very recent history where we saw that stocks and bonds were correlated, but normally they don't. When markets, when the, the stock markets do well, the bonds kind of are pretty vanilla. When the stock market does poorly, bonds can be pretty impressive. So uh, just know those are realities. Disadvantages, there is fluctuation, but you're not going to have as high a potential with a traditional bond. High yield bond, that's Billy Joe, Jim Bob's Diesel Fried Chicken. Those are places that are desperate for your money. They're trying to expand their business. They've got specific goals that they're trying to reach that may or may not be in their pocket. And so they're going to get into your pocket. They're willing to loan. They want you, you want, they want you to loan them money and they're willing to pay you. You see some of these hit six, seven, eight percent sometimes, maybe even higher. But the higher you go, the higher risk you've got, the higher chance of default. So they pay well, but okay, quick review. You got the corporate bond, you got the municipal bond. Municipal bonds are not going to be taxed by the federal government, by the way. So that actually gives a benefit. And now we're into stock, and Matt gets to talk stock. Okay, yay, stock. Okay, so stock, once again, is as he said, is ownership, right? So the ownership that you have is a portion of the company. And the size of the company dictates what that portion is. If you're buying Walmart, you have a very small portion of the company. And if you're buying a small company that no one's ever heard of, you're going to have a larger portion. But with that portion comes risk as well. And Yeah. So obviously shares of stock represent the ownership portion. Percentage of ownership is determined by really the size of the company. And 
sometimes stocks kick out dividends. A dividend is the same thing that a, a bond is going to kick out. So basically they're paying you off of the, the uh, a dividend is a bond kicks out a dividend, but in a stock, it's not paid off of a debt. The dividend is actually coming out of the earnings. So over earnings come to shareholders. Not all stocks do that. Some stocks do. And you generally buy a stock for the dividend, not necessarily, uh, if, you're, if you're buying it for the dividend, it's set up that way. Okay, so you have common versus preferred. The preferred stock would be a stock you're buying for the dividend. A common stock is the regular stock that you're buying just for growth opportunity. A preferred, preferred stock, the reason why it's preferred is because it sits a little bit higher on the list if the company goes under, that preferred stockholder is going to get mon more money back than a common stockholder would. And they also kick out a dividend. Generally, you're not buying preferred for the growth of the company. You're buying it for uh, income. Okay, so the categories, small, mid, and large. And we're going to go over these categories a little bit more in a second. Sorry, I left my cheat sheet. So small, mid, and large. A large cap company is anything over $10 billion in capitalization. Mid cap is two two billion to ten billion, and small cap is two hundred and fifty million to two billion. These lines obviously fuzz a little bit at the edges, but the idea here is that you want to be invested in in all of these groups, not just one group, not just large caps, not just small caps, because they're all going to cycle at different times. And the name of the game here is diversification. We don't want a single pinpoint. We want to spread out. Think of it as Walking in the snow in a stiletto heel or in a snowshoe? Which way is going to be more effective? Which way is going to get you where you want to go? So in order to get us to a safe crossing, we want to diversify and spread out. We want to be in small, mid, cap, and large. And um, we want to be able to look at all of these places. They're all going to have different times. Then you're also going to have growth and value inside of small, mid, cap, and large. So you're going to have a growth stock, a, a large cap growth and a large cap value. And income generally would, is its own space. It's not, not generally large cap, large cap income. That, that does function that way, but most of the time you'll have a dividend producing fund um, as, opposed to, as opposed to large cap div, you know, income. So what is, large, what is growth value and in income? Growth would be the idea that you're buying it right now, expecting it to continue to go up. Value is it's undervalued and you're expecting it to come back to value. Think of going shopping and there's something that's never on sale. It just is what it is. You can never get it on sale because it's so popular. The price is what it is. You, that would be growth. You're buying it at what the price is because it's not going to go down. But then there's the sale rack. You expect, you know, the sale's going to go, go off in a week. You're going to go buy that. And then after a week, it will return back to value. You could actually sell that, assuming you could get someone to buy it from you at a higher rate. That's the difference between growth and value. And income, sorry, I didn't include it. Income is a dividend producing place where you're trying to get, trying to get a stable amount of income going forward. So what are the investment options? What are the advantages of, of buying stock? Historically high long-term returns. Absolutely, ownership rights. And then you can get dividends and they're easy to buy and sell. Easy to buy and sell is, is true. You can, you can go through a financial advisor, you can go get your own platform like Robinhood and, and you can buy these things. The question isn't how easy are they to buy, the question is, do you know which one to buy? That's really a bigger question, right? And that's kind of a disadvantage. The disadvantage is what to get, how to know what to get. You gotta do some research. Because if you get a bad company and you have that one company and you pin pinhole down, you're not going to do well, right? So we need to diversify out. And that's why we want to have want to have a lot more market share. Also, may not be appropriate for short, short term is probably true. If you're talking about one to two years, maybe isn't our best option. But if you're talking about longer than that, you're probably going to do okay. So large cap, 10 billion or more. Let's talk about some companies that are large cap. Apple, Amazon, Walmart, Exxon. Those would be examples of large cap companies. Very good places to invest your money. But large cap companies are also going to have moments where they're down. Recently, large cap growth, 
that division has been doing very well this year. But because large cap growth is up, a lot of people in the market are saying, hey, we shouldn't buy large cap growth right now because has it peaked? And are we going to be getting in too late and not getting enough of the growth? So let's look at large cap value. That would be other companies that are undervalued. So that those are some examples of large cap growth and why we're investing in those places. Let's look at mid cap. Some examples of mid cap, Burlington Coat Factory, TransUnion, the credit company, and then Graco, the company that makes baby equipment uh, or equipment like <laughs> car seats and things like that. So mid cap, mid cap growth has traditionally been a very good place to invest over a long time. They will have their down moments um, and they can go lower than large cap growth. Large cap growth is a little more stable. Mid cap growth can be a little bit higher risk and higher reward. Mid cap value is the same type of space as mid cap growth or you know, the same idea with large cap value. It's going to have its time. Sometimes value in this market is supposed to be doing well, kind of a recovering market. You should do well with value. It's not been doing as well recently. Growth has. And that's dictated by where people are investing. Small cap. Let's look at some examples there. Krispy Kreme, Dole, and Guess, which is interesting because you would think a small cap company might be a startup company. Not always. And sometimes those companies are small enough that it gives they're more maneuverable and they can try different things that other people haven't tried. And sometimes they're just a company that hasn't got, got as much breadth in them. Or maybe they've come back down. They were a large cap value and they dropped down to a mid cap growth because that's just where they're at. But that gives you an idea of what those places are and what they're doing. Okay, let's talk about other investment options. So you can invest in the stock market or you can invest in real estate. A lot of people use real estate as a place to invest. You know, they get a couple of rentals and that's what they expect their retirement income to come from. It's not a bad option. It's a lot more, it's a lot more hands-on than investing in the market. Real estate would be something where you're buying this place, you're buying several places, and you're either having someone else manage it for you or you're managing it yourself. Very, very valid option. We're not, we're definitely not making enough houses right now. So it's a pretty good option at times. Stock options, options and futures. Those are places where, you know, when we're investing, we're really not gambling. We're making wise choices and we're investing in a company, the ownership, as long as we're not buying penny stocks, that company's not going away. It might lose some value, but it's not going away. And it, if it, we stay in it, the market should cycle back up and we should be okay. But stock options and futures, that's a little bit more of gambling, a little bit more of a space where we're saying, hey, I think this is going to do well, or I think this is going to do well, and I'm willing to put a little bit of money out there to try it. They're not bad things to do. They're actually very valid, but understand that they're a lot more speculative and a lot more risk involved because you're, you're betting that in the future, this stock is going to be worth something or this commodity, corn, gold, oil, they're going to be worth something. In fact, oil futures affect the way gasoline is charged all the time. That's actually how gasoline, what the price of gasoline is based off of, oil futures, not currently a price of oil. It's based on the futures. So if futures are going up, gas goes up because people have to restock what they have. Collectibles, that's a harder space to get into, but as Ryan was saying earlier, um, today, you know, baseball cards. If you collected baseball cards, sometimes those have value and that's a collectible. But it takes a lot more expertise for collectibles, by the way. Okay, so mutual funds, it's pooled with others. Mutual fund is just what it means, mutual. We go in together. We buy large cap growth funds together because we can't spread out our money as effectively by ourselves. So if you're a small time investor, which I'm a small time investor, if you have less than $2 million to invest, you're probably going to be better served by buying mutual funds than by buying individual stock yourself. That doesn't mean you can't go buy individual stock, but you won't be diversified and you won't be able to buy a group of large cap funds, which might encompass 100, 200 stocks and spread you out across those large cap growths instead of buying one or two, which might be really good right now, but maybe they have problems in the future. So mutual funds are gonna give you that instance diversification just by having one fund. And if you have large cap growth and large cap value, now all of a sudden you're spread across several sectors, and then we could get all of those in just a couple of mutual funds. 
And we could be a smaller investor, but still spread across. And as you can see here, mutual funds incorporate every other thing that we're working with. Money market funds, bond funds, stock funds, and international funds. So they're not necessarily anything different. Active versus passive means that, and you'll see this in a minute when we go into ETFs, active management is a fund where somebody's buying and selling stocks inside of the fund for you. Passive means it's like an S&P 500 clone where they're not doing anything, but you know what it's invested in. And the difference between active and passive is cost. One, active management works better in some areas and passive works better in other areas. For instance, over the last 10 years when money was cheap, passive was pretty good because you could just go into any growth piece and it was working and you had lower costs. But in a tighter market where money isn't as expensive, isn't as cheap, then active sometimes does a better job because someone's being choosy for you. Same, this has the same um, really advantages and disadvantages as stocks and bonds. With the one small piece, it is more liquid. A mutual fund is required to buy the stock back from you. You always have a ready buyer. With a stock, you have to go out and find somebody who's interested in buying. But a mutual fund has to buy that from you at the end of the day. So that's a little bit better for you as the investor because you, you know you have somebody who's constantly there ready to buy it back. Uh, we have a raised hand. Uh, Dr. Kia Turner wants to ask a question. Yeah. Hi, sorry, I was late. Uh, okay. So you may have covered this. How do we vet our options? So for example, what you just said about, I used to be a teacher and we were invested in mutual funds through our like retirement system, right? And now based yeah. on what you just said, I understand why that is now. I used to have no idea. So thank you for that. But okay. as um, now a solopreneur, how do I vet what's the best investment option for me? So like where I currently select stocks on Cash App, don't judge me. I select stocks on Cash App based on just things I like, right? But sure. if I wanted to switch that and do like mutual funds, where do you go? I'm not a part of a school system anymore. I work for myself. How do I find kind of these places? Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. Great question. So so what you're saying is how do I value how do I evaluate the mutual fund that I'm trying to get? I think the you know, you're going to have to do some research. One good place to go, morningstar.com, great website that's going to give you information on every mutual fund. There is a pay side of that, but the free side still gives you the basic information of a mutual fund. So what you want to do is go through and start looking at, start understanding based on, we're going to go over a little bit more, some diversification, start understanding that you need to have some of all of these pieces. Go out there and find and, and we're going to talk about um, portfolio composition here in a minute. You go out and find some form that tells you how much large cap, how much small cap, how much mid cap you should have, and then start investigating those funds. And I think Morningstar is going to be a good place. There are a lot of places that do this. That's the place that isn't associated with any company. Yahoo lets you look at funds as well. Um, Yahoo Finance. You can do that from a couple different places. I use Morningstar a lot to talk to clients and it's a pretty good site to start evaluating funds. Some of the ways you want to evaluate them is look at what the growth has been and then also look at their, look at their risk categories. Um, and that's probably another conversation we need to go over is, is evaluating them from risk. What are the risk categories and what are those issues? Um, but I think that starts. The other thing you can do is talk to a financial advisor Financial advisors can't, they generally don't charge you for having a conversation. They charge you if you invest with them. So having a conversation and trying to get the lay of the land isn't going to cost you money. It's a nice way to just get some information, especially if you come into it, say, hey, I might be an investor, but I really want to understand stuff. If you go into it honest like that, most financial advisors are going to talk to you and give you a chance to go over things. But that's really a good place to start, in my opinion. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you very much. I just put that in my Google Notes. Okay, okay. thanks. Awesome. No, no, good. Um, okay, so let's move on real, real quick. So ETFs, that's an exchange traded fund. What this means is it's a mutual fund that's traded like a stock. 
Like I said, mutual funds have to buy buy from you daily. They're required to. You don't trade them on the market. You you put in an order, and at the end of the day, all the orders get get done by a mutual fund. Okay, but stocks trade during the day, minute by minute. An ETF is a mutual fund that's trading like that. And generally, an ETF is a passive management fund. Not always. Sometimes that that ETF isn't passive. It's actively managed. So they have a little bit of a tax benefit to them. So a mutual fund, you're going to get some taxes at the end of the year if you're in a non-retirement account. And a, an ETF is going to trade like a stock. So you only pay taxes when you sell it. Okay. Uh, the reason why mutual funds have some taxes is because they have a pass-through system. And instead of them paying the taxes and you paying the taxes and having it double up, they pass it through to you so that you don't double the taxes. That's a longer... Uh, really requires a longer explanation, but that's kind of the short, short system there. Okay. So this gets more to that, to the answer of that asset allocation. We got to have diversification, which I've been talking about, right? We want mutual funds to be diversified, spread across so we can have that snowshoe, not a pinpoint. And that diversification goes back all the way. We got to talk what Ryan talked about at the beginning, risk tolerance and time frames. If I have a long time frame and I have a high risk tolerance, I want to diversify. I still want to diversify, but I want to be aggressive in my diversification. I want to have more growth and, and less value, unless it's a moment to be in value. And I don't want to necessarily look for income. I'm looking for growth. But if my time frame is short or my risk tolerance is low, or I'm in a payout phase of life, I want to have a little bit more stability, maybe a little bit more income. Okay, so here's a conservative model. These are very generic. And notice how in the stocks, it's not telling you what type of stocks or what type of bonds. Do we want muni bonds? Do we want um, high yield bonds? So that answer, if you have any client that is that conservative, I don't have any client that's conservative. This is ultra conservative. I, I don't think it's conservative. Uh, I would not typically put a client, even a conservative client in, in this space. I might put them in 50% in bonds and 40, 45% in stocks and then a little bit of cash alternative. But this is this is a very low growth and, hey, let's just manage the money as it's going out. But remember, even in retirement, you still got to make money. Why? Because inflation happens. And you, if you're on a fixed income, guess what? You might need more money as inflation goes up, right? So we still want to make money. This is a little too conservative, but it gives you the idea that in a conservative space, we're using something that has lower growth and that bonds piece and maybe a little bit of growth and a little bit of stability in the cash and stock, okay? And then in the moderate, I would say this is closer to conservative in my opinion, but let's just assume this is moderate for a second. Um, the idea here is that you want some growth and some stability. Moderate would be a place where you're in, you know, you're closer to retirement or you're maybe in your mid sixties, but you're not using your retirement funds for another five or six years. We're still gonna say moderate. And then if you look at this aggressive, uh, I would say aggressive, by the way, would be having 15% in bonds, no cash, and the rest in stock. Okay, 85, 15. And then a moderate for me, well, moderate for me would be more like 60, 65, 35 stocks and bonds with very little cash alternative. Um, that, that's kind of how I look at those spaces. And then in this, in this type of space, you're going to have a lot of growth options because we're aggressive. We're trying to make money. We're trying to buy something and let it you know, move up, not trying to um, just manage things as they go along. Um, any questions on that? Okay, so this is, sorry, I didn't raise my hand this time. This is Kia <laughs> no, again. <it's> okay. <laughs> so when I'm looking at mutual funds, should I look at them in terms of these percentages? Like, will they have, and I've never done it. That's why I'm asking. So will they have something that says like, hey, our investment breakdown looks like this, kind of like a pie chart like this. So you kind of know what you're getting into. So the mutual fund, you're not typically, some mutual funds have bonds and stocks in them, but most, most don't. Most of the time you're going to buy a stock mutual fund and a bond mutual fund. This allocation is less about what's inside the fund and more about you accumulating those percentages in your portfolio overall. 
So you're going to go out and buy. Overall, you have $100,000 to invest. 75, 80,000 of that is going to be in stock mutual funds. 15, of that okay. is going to be in bond mutual funds. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then inside of that, you're going to have those individual slices, large cap growth, large cap value, mid cap growth, mid cap value, small cap, small cap growth and value. And you're going to want to have different percentages of those because that's what gives you diversification. And Dr. Turner, I would reflect that this is how we find out if you're a nerd or not. Because if you love all this and you're like, I got to, I got to keep track of this. It's just fun. Then you might be a nerd. But if you're going, oh, I hate this, you're probably more popular than those of us who are nerds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then I think I'm somewhere in the middle because <laughs> okay. I definitely want to know more because, you know, financial management is just critical to long-term success. Absolutely. But I definitely don't feel like an expert at all in this moment. Yeah. So I think even if you go and talk to a financial advisor on your own, even if you go and work with somebody, it is still very important for you to know what they're telling you. Very important for you to be schooled in this so that when you're un you're understanding what's going on, because you're your only advocate, right? And so even if you go and talk to somebody, this is still really important information for you to take with you. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I think probably the next thing we need to go over is, is looking individually, how do we assess uh, an individual stock and how do we assess an individual mutual fund? That's you know, this is still a little bit more broadband, but but understanding portfolio development and portfolio bringing together, that's that's really where you need to start looking, not as an individual stock, but let's look at everything as a whole. Because if I'm just looking at one thing, that's my pinhole, right? And I want to have a nice broad base. I want to have that that snowshoe. And that's really what we need to look at as portfolio in 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 its entirety. And this is a great, this is kind of the end of, of the the actual slideshow. So yes, thank say, you. you know, open questions at this point. Questions, I mean, anybody? Were you going to explain that, how to evaluate the individual stuff? Oh. <laughs> or is that another session? No, that's going to have to be the next one because that's actually like, 30 minutes in and of itself. Oh, okay. Got it. I was just waiting. Okay. No, no, that's a fair question. I meant, I said that's the next thing, but I meant like the next class. So I apologize. That wasn't well that's, said. Okay. Great question. Do you think it's worth investing in small amounts? So for example, I definitely do not have $100,000 to put anywhere. So do you mm -hmm. think it's like a waste of time to invest via like no. cash up where you can only invest like a few hundred or should you just build no. up that way? Because okay, when I talk to financial advisors, they're like, so what do you have, like 10K to put somewhere? And I'm like, friend, I have two kids. Where's the 10K? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Okay, let me, let me address that. I used 100,000 in my example, by the way, because it was easy numbers. 80% of 100 is 80,000, right? That was it. Um, right. So, so let's go down to 50 bucks. The reason why Ryan started with that at the very beginning, if I'm in, if I have zero money to start with, but I have $50 to invest monthly, start there. Start wherever you can start. Investing now is going to pay off in the future. If you wait okay. to the future, you don't get that return. So start now, mm -hmm. start wherever you can start, start with what's affordable. And, and let me okay. throw on top of that. So if somebody started investing $50 a month when they were 20 years old and they did it for eight years and they're sibling, they're twin, waited those eight years and started doing 50 bucks a month at 28 the one who waited will never catch up with the investment of the one who started with 50 bucks a month and stopped when they were 28. so oh wow yeah always start because every start dollar whenever matters. you can and that's that rule of 72 that doubling effect time matters money matters everything matters and what you're doing on a cash app or any other small app like that that's a cheap way to get a great education you're an education girl you understand yeah. what it means to get educated and you're paying tiny bits of money that you could make money back on and you're getting it. Yeah. Great idea. So find a place. If you go, even if you go work with somebody or you open up Robin hood on your own, find a place where you can start, figure out what your budget will allow. If it's 50 bucks, go with that. Don't stress. Don't strain for that 50 bucks. Start with something that's, 
that you know 100% I'm going to be fine living without that money this month and then build on it. Even if you know for certain, like, oh, I could do $500, start with, with 100 or 200 or start, if, if you know I can do 25 bucks a month, start there because what we don't want to do is have that moment where we have to go backwards and that just makes it very difficult to go back and forward. So start with things and then build. Build when you're solid and make sure that's a solid base before you move forward because we want to keep having that good positive return and keep having that understanding and not get negative effects that make us go, oh, I don't want to invest anymore. That that turned out yeah. bad. Yeah. And so do you know, so we need to, because that's what I do, but then you just kind of leave it in there and just, because I I had a financial advisor tell me to use Cash App, which is how I started and he was just like, play around with it and you'll get a feel for what you're doing and just leave it in there no matter what. And yeah. that's what I've been doing for like the past year. And I'm like, I don't know how to tell if I'm being successful or not, you know, because <laughs> it goes up and down. You Nobody's an overnight millionaire or anything. So right. good to know that it's something to just kind of stay the course with. Yeah. So, so think definitely stay the course. Absolutely. And, and keep in mind that the closer you are, you know, your vision looks like this and the further it comes back, the more you get a better vision. So one year is really difficult to have that understanding, right? Cause, Oh, it's going up and down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Five years, all of a sudden you go, Oh, wait a second. I've made money in five years, 10 years. So yeah, just keep at it because over time it's going to be very clear that you're doing something. Keep investing, find good places. Now you want to be in quality funds. You want to be in quality places. That's absolutely true and getting some help looking for that or going and doing the research. I think you're capable of that. We're all capable. Um, and hopefully, you know, either way you do that, just make sure you're, you're getting in something good. You know, Growth Fund of America from, from um, American funds. Solid fund is it's gonna company. be fine. Yeah. It, it's gonna do that. Generic, good, and it's gonna help. So places like that, you're gonna do okay with. And I would reflect, so, Matt, do you have any clients who do any of their own stock trading and they ask you your input? Um, sometimes. Yeah. We, we both, there are people who like to play in this space on the side and they will come and ask us, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And most financial advisors are going to answer the question. They're going to be willing to lend a hand and say, oh yeah, here's my opinion. They don't have to manage your money. Most, most financial advisors are going to be kind and not say, well, then you owe me this because yeah. I gave you advice. That's no, absurd. It's not going to work. Yeah, and generally then all you're looking for is somebody who will treat you professionally, will teach you. And whether yeah. whether you use them or not, they're willing to befriend you and lend a hand. Yeah. In Ooh. fact, that's a great way to look up an advisor. If they're doing that, probably not the best place. Okay. Sarah, Sarah's got a hand raised. All right. Go ahead, Sarah. Hey, yeah. So I had a question about, so let's say we have it set aside where there's $50 a month, you know, to invest. Would you say put all of that $50 on say like Robin hood or whatnot, or would you say do just a percentage, like $25 to the stock and then $25 to uh, what was it like a bond or something like that? Would you yeah. divvy that up or would you be like this month, do this next month, start something else? So you, that's a great question. Um, I, I think what you want to do is first, Figure out what type of investor you are, what your goal is. Um, are you young? Is this for retirement? Do I have 30 years? If that's the case, if this is about retirement and you have a long time, go stock all the time. If this is- But stock, individual stock or stock mutual fund? Either one is fine. I like mutual fund, especially if we're smaller investors. I explained that. I would go stock uh, a stock mutual fund just because it gives you better diversification and you don't have to be the best stock picker at that point. Um, you can trust somebody else to do that, but you want to go growth. If this is for a short time thing, a short term thing, I'm trying to save for a car. I'm trying to save for a house. And then you're talking the cash answers and the bond answers. Then, then you're then you're looking about half and half, right? Yeah. So so or or maybe all bond. You know, it, it depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, I think that dictates exactly where you're going. And then Sarah, I would also reflect. You have to figure out your own personality. Are you the person who says, I want to pick my own stuff or I want help? And if you're saying, I don't want to pick anything myself, I just want help. Then you're looking for a financial advisor who says, I don't have a minimum. I just help people. I don't, I don't, I don't care. You know, if you got 50 bucks a month, I'll just help you. I'll put you where I think it makes sense. 
versus just trying to do it on your own. So those do exist. There are some places that have minimums. You'll hear everything from a quarter of a million dollars to about $5,000. And then there'll be people who say, I don't have a minimum. I just help people. Yeah. So, you know, that's if you're saying, I don't want to do it on my own, but I want to have my hands in. I want to learn. I want to listen. I want to see what it is. You find somebody who will help you. If you, if you want to do it on your own, great. More power to you too. Yeah. I, th I think, you know, we, you want to be investigating and understanding these funds. Even if you're working with somebody you still need to be educated, right? The other part of that is when he said type, what type of investor are you? Are you the type of investor that's very nervous? That's going to be worried about the market. If the market's down, you go, oh, I don't know if it's doing this right. Or are you the type of investor who goes, I, I just put it in and I don't worry about it. Then the person who's not worried about it, be more aggressive, be all in stocks. If the person who's more worried, you need to have a mix. So that plays into it as well. Your goal and who you are. Yes, Daniel, sorry. Uh, can you speak a little on the 457 plan, uh, specifically on what percentage you would invest and advantages for a before or tax basis? How old are you, Daniel? I'm 40. Okay. And do you have a medium, small, or big pile that's in that 457? Oh, I'm just starting. Okay. okay. So small pile. Okay. So number one, you want to get everything that your company is giving you uh, in a match. So 100% put whatever in they, they require for you to get the full match. If you have to put in 6% to have them match you at three, that's what you're gonna go in at, okay? Do that 100% and and keep going through with that. What you wanna, what you wanna invest in that, they most of the time they're gonna have target date funds and they're gonna have other funds. Target date's not bad. If that's what you have to choose from, choose and you're trying to be aggressive, you're 40, you want this to grow, choose the, the latest offering. You know, if it's 2060, go 2060. If in a couple of years it becomes 2065, move to that one. That's going to be more aggressive. Target date funds get more conservative as they get closer. And you want to stay on the outside edge as you're younger and staying aggressive. And you're busy going, I'm 40. I don't feel young. But in numbers, again, I talked Investing, about that 15 you years. You got more than 15 years of retirement. That makes you young. And so you invest aggressively. Thank you, gentlemen. No. Yeah, absolutely. Did that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Great. Perfect. Thank okay, you. cool. Anybody else in the party? I have a question. <laughs> so yesterday in the news, uh, I read that uh, President Biden is going to either already had signed a law about uh, more advisors becoming fiduciaries or he's going to sign it into law. So what do you think about that? The criticism was that uh, for some reason, uh, people with low income just won't be able to find uh, financial advisors. So what do you think about this? I'm glad yeah. to feel that one. So, so for the most part, for the most part, financial advisors are going to behave like a fiduciary, whether or not they're required to. There are some bad actors out there but they're the vast minority. And you probably are gonna have a gut level reaction that says this person feels greasy and slimy. I don't think I wanna deal with them. And so you don't. Now, whether or not someone has the label fiduciary over the last 30 years, financial advisors who have the label fiduciary have been sued more often for inappropriate behavior than those who don't. Why? Who knows why? I'm not saying they're worse or better. Theoretically, the, a fiduciary is supposed to only do things that are in your interest and not their own. I would argue, you interview, an, if you're going to use a financial advisor, you interview a few, you sit with a few, and you find one that you like, you feel like you could get to know, and you feel like you could trust, and don't worry about whether or not they are categorically a fiduciary. Figure out whether you think, think they're going to behave like one anyway. Most of us already have to be a fiduciary. If we're working on any kind of ERISA plan, we have to function that way anyway. And most of us in the industry are already doing it, whether required to or not. So the adding, making everyone have that standard, what that does for the small client is it says now everybody can sue the financial advisor for what they view as not a great piece of advice. And so what that does is it means financial advisors who are worried about that will not take the small investor. They won't help them. They'll say, you're too small. My minimum's too high. I'm not going to help you because that opens the door for them to get a, be sued by somebody who doesn't know as much, haven't done as much, but can still complain. 
And so, yes, if, if it pushes too far, it has the reality that that will happen. It will cause people who are used to be willing to help people with small amounts of money to not help anymore. Yeah. But there will be people who say, no, I'll take the risk. I'll help the, uh, I'll help the little people. Um, I actually, I, I did an assessment on my own book of business. I help 18% of my people for free because they're not big enough clients for me to worry about billing. And so I just do that. I think Matt's very similar. They help a lot of people for free because it's just why charge somebody when they're just starting out, they just need all their assets to go in yeah. and, and, and get to traction. Uh, I mean, so, it's, yeah. it's also a, a flip point of that. You know, I want you to be a better investor for you. And it also helps me in the long run if you're a great investor in the future, right? So I want to help you understand what you're doing and build your build your assets so that it works for both of us. And that sometimes is an investment in time. Okay, that's great. So look for advisors who don't have minimums or have very low minimums because those are the people that are willing to work in there. An advisor that has a you know fifty thousand dollar minimum, obviously that's that's a person who's not wanting to work with you know lower investors. And, and so you already understand who that is. Putting more limits on things are just going to drive some people out of that business. Just like anything else, if you tax something, you lose it. And somewhat that will turn people away. So. And, and Alina, you bring up a really interesting point because those people I help for free, if the fullest extent of that fiduciary law is pushed forward, I cannot keep them. They have to go to where they can't get help. So that's the push pull. It's a great idea on paper. But if people are already behaving appropriately, it's better to let them do that than to take away the help that the small investor could have. So it's 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 a tough it's a tough call because you want people to do what's right for people, but if you push too hard, now you've created a problem and a vacuum will develop. So uh, it, it's it is a very touchy thing right now in the financial advisor world because the 90% of people out there who are doing good things are going, why do you want to tie my hands? Why do you want to make it so I can't help people? And the 10% are, who are doing bad stuff are going, ooh, ooh, don't, don't make that law. Then I can't steal from people. So nobody wins when we argue over stupid stuff. How about that? Thank you. Yeah. So my question is about um, dollar cost averaging. So if one has, um, let's just say $7,000 to invest for Roth IRA this year, mm -hmm. is it better to invest lump sum or cost dollar averaging? So, so typically think of it this way, lump sum, if you put it in at the perfect day, that's going to be better. So if you knew the, the day that had the lowest, uh, you know, the market was down the lowest, hey, invest that day and then it comes back up. Wow, that's great. Dollar cost averaging just makes you a better investor over the long haul. So what will happen is you'll catch some low days and you'll catch some high days and you'll end up being a smart investor by if the market's down, you buy more, you'll end up buying more. And if the market's up, you'll buy less. If you're doing the same amount over that month, right? Getting to 7,000, you're doing the same amount each month. You become a very disciplined investor that way. And you'll generally reap more benefits than trying to pinpoint because we're just not going to know the best day. And I would argue you have two, you, your question has two days to it. Are you investing today or tomorrow? Because here's the thing, statistically, again, I'm, I'm a statistics guy. Any one day in the market, there's a 52% chance that you're going to make money as opposed to a slot machine with 48%. So I can either play a game I know eventually I'll lose or play a game I eventually will win. At one year, investment in the stock market, 75% of the time is going to be profitable. So if you have $7,000, you may say, well, the longer I'm in, the greater odds I win. Therefore, I plunk my $7,000 in as soon as I can because I have the greatest opportunity going forward. However, tomorrow and the next year as the new January 1 starts, then I want to start dollar cost averaging because I can't read the future. And so I can start driving my money in. If I have a pile now, you get started when you can, because when you have the cash is always the right time to start. But in the future, you dollar cost average in because tomorrow you don't know what's coming. And so you dollar cost average. Thank you. Absolutely. I have a question. Uh, 
difference between 401k or 403b and IRA? Does it make any sense to move your money from 403b or 401k into IRA? Which one so, is better? Which one is worse? Uh, so they're they're not different in the way the taxes taxes are treated. They're different in the way they're managed. So a 403b has to have um, an external partner. So the company that you're in, another group that's overseeing that, and then you. So it's a triangle, right? So if you want to get money out or you want to do things, you kind of have to go through that group. IRA, you. 401k, company, and you. So there's still more, more groups. We always want to bring it down to where you're the sole person in charge, right? So that's that's the big difference why you want to move things to an IRA. They don't function any differently tax-wise. Another reason why you might want to get out of 403B or 401k is because the investments inside might not be your best options. A lot of times they have to be very generic for a 401k. They're not going to give you a wide, uh, a wide group of funds because they're a fiduciary and they want to limit the amount of times they can get sued. So they give you a very, very limited vanilla option. And cheap stuff. And cheap stuff. So actually, I would also add the difference between a 401k and a 403b is that there's not one. They're the exact same thing. A 403b is what is used in a not-for-profit company. A 401k is what is used in a for-profit company. And what's inside them is up to that, that record-keeping firm who's holding the assets. Yes. So they're going to perform exactly the same. They're the exact same thing. They're just for-profit versus not-for-profit. Where an IRA, you're the only holder. So in theory, if you work for a company that is either a not-for-profit or a for-profit and they go under, there is a small chance that if they don't liquidate their assets in the right way as they go under, they can actually liquidate your retirement assets to pay their bills. If you have taken your money out of a 401k or 403b when you're no longer working there and you put it into an IRA, no one can ever access it other than you. It's just kid. you. So it doesn't happen very often, but legally it can. And so that's one of the reasons we encourage people to vet carefully and choose carefully what's best for them to decide what they want to do. Stay put, move to where they're currently working, or hold it out on their own as an IRA. Yeah. What if those accounts for 3B or 401k and IRA within the same company? Can, can the, that happen? The IRA won't be You're with right. the same company generally. Well, but if Fidelity was holding the 401k, Fidelity can also hold a 403b and Fidelity I think, could be your Do IRA you mean person. the same company you're working for or the same uh, the, the, the same in investment company. Okay, then that's true. Okay. It doesn't make a difference there either because it's the... So let's say that you have the same investment inside of that, right? It's Fidelity and you have the same Fidelity options in all three. You still want to have the utmost control over it. So you want to go to an IRA where there's only you in charge. And the other thing that could happen in retirement, if you are a charitable person, after you're 70 and a half now, you can start giving straight from your IRA to a charity where you can't do that from a 401k or 403b. And here's the difference. If you pull your money out of the 401k, you're paying taxes on it, then you give it to the charity. If you pull the money from an IRA and give straight to the charity, you never went through your hands. You didn't pay taxes on it. You still took your required distribution. It just went straight to the charity without you paying taxes on it. So there's a tiny, tiny tax advantage in the IRA space as well. Yeah, but mostly it's about control at that point. If you had all the same investments in it, you're still more in control of the IRA than you are in the 401k or the 403b. You have more people you have to talk to. Sit down at the table with three people for a 403b and two people for a 401k and one person for an IRA. So you want to be in control of your own money, not let a company have some, you know, some say in it. But you will be responsible for choosing the right company where to put your money in the stock. I mean, to choose the stock of certain company well, when you have. So yes, IRA. that's true. You could stay with the same the same mutual fund that that you were in. So if you pull it out and it's in a target fund, American you can stay fund. in the same. You can you can go into American Fund Growth Fund of America. You can stay in the same fund that you were in in the four hundred three b or the four hundred one k. You're in charge of choosing it, but you're also in charge of choosing it inside the 401k, right? They give you those options and you choose from what's on the paper in front of you. You can be in the same places. Um, at that point, it, it becomes who's in charge. I stipulate that if you move out of the 401k or the 403b, you're going to have more options, way more options. And yes, you're still in charge of picking it, but that still gives you a better opportunity to be in better places. 
and, and reflect when he says you pick it that's if you're doing it on your own most people as their pile of money gets bigger a lot of people get a little more gun shy about managing it themselves and that's when they go to a professional and say i want an ira but i don't want to do it myself i'd like to know i'd like to have some say but i don't want to pick all that myself and that's when you typically see people consider going to a professional yeah that way they're not doing all the picking on their own but even if you are, I still think you being in charge of it versus somebody else's and, and by somebody else, I mean the company, the company, you having to talk to the company. So if you're in, if you're 67, 68, 69, 70, and you want to take money out of your 403B, you then have to submit paperwork to people you're not talking to, to the company you were at, say a, a school, and and then they got to go to the third party administrator. That's a bit of a hassle versus either going into your Robinhood account or talking to your financial advisor who you can see face to face. Right. You know, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, Does that answer the question? Yes, that did. Uh, you mentioned Robinhood. What other investment platforms are there that people can individually find? There's, there's hundreds of them. I would say invest trade is a very large one that people know. Yeah. Um, and Robin Hood's track record is that they attract the tiny investor and most people after they advance a certain way they don't stay on there a lot of times they're looking for a larger interface with larger research pools so you'll see them graduate to something like invest trade do you know others that you're hearing people talk about and that would be the big one that I hear but yeah I mean the reason why Robin Hood is brought up is is just because it's a, a smaller investor starting place it's popular um, it's popular there there are lots of different platforms and there are even platforms in in places like F with fidelity you can be your own advisor you can be investing with fidelity and have that as your plat investing platform it's going to it's going to use more fidelity funds versus other things but you can be in places like that you can be with uh, morgan stanley they have their own investments place so you can start to graduate um, into other places but a lot of different mutual fund families or investment banking sources will have their own platform. Okay, here's Betterment, Stash, Vanguard, Vanguard which is like a fidelity in that space. Kind of a generic. Um, those would be three that I would say are, are well recognized where you can actually have what's called a robo advisor where you're gonna input your, your age and you're gonna say, they're gonna answer 15 questions to figure out your risk profile and they're gonna say, and here's your portfolio. And it's, it's a robot. It's literally, there's no human interface, but you're putting your data in and you're getting some kind of response back and off you go. And it's low cost. So, yeah. yeah. And could you repeat the name Stash, Vanguard, um, and what else? Stash, Betterment, and Vanguard. And here's one called Wealthfront. I haven't heard of it, but it's got really good reviews. And again, those are going to be, if you're, you know, if you want to do it yourself and you don't want human help, those are going to be pretty doggone decent. If you want human help, then you're looking at talking to an advisor of some kind, whether it's remote or, or local or a company yeah. you know, or Vanguard has, you can actually hire a Vanguard advisor. Um, Same with and, Fidelity. Yeah. Fidelity will talk, you can talk to an advisor and it's not going to cost you more to talk to that advisor. In, um, in most cases, they're, they're new, they're young, they're learning, and they're a great place to learn. And then a lot of times they jump out and go out to a private yeah. firm after. But they're their probably team. not going to give you horrible advice. Yeah. You're, you're going to do pretty well. Yeah. So um, those those are great places to start out. And and they'll give you mutual funds so that you're a little bit more diversified. Yeah. Thank you. So you would recommend going to a robo advisor, particularly for like younger, younger people? So I think that's, that's an interesting um, question. I would recommend it if you are opposed to working with somebody. Yeah. And if you don't want to do the research yourself, then yes. If you are good at doing research and you want to dig into this and you want to find out, then you should do it yourself. If you want help, then you should probably go get help and sit down in front of somebody. But if you want help, but you don't want to, you know, you're like not trusting people, then a robo advisor is another option. I don't know that, that it would be the top of our list option, but it is an option. It's better than nothing. It is better than nothing. But it's also personal. You know yourself. And so you go, okay, what, what am I going to be most comfortable with? And whatever makes you comfortable is what helps you get that education and, Absolutely. and build your future. That's what you do. 
And also because, it's low cost, lower cost compared to human advisor, correct? It can it, be. Yeah, yeah, it can be. It depends. Most of the time it probably would be um, lower cost than a, than a human advisor. That's true. You're not going to find a robo advisor for free. Even if it says no cost per trade, you're still, there's a margin that happens in every trade. And there's a, a whole career that's called a market maker. And all those no fee accounts, the market maker is who's making that money. And so you're getting charged you know, something you're, somewhere. Yeah, you're always paying something somewhere. The question is, am I paying them a website? Am I paying a market maker? Am I paying an advisor? And you've asked a really good question because you say cheaper. So you go, what's what's cheap? So philosophically, let's say you're talking with an advisor and they say, what you know, you're saying, what, what do you charge? So I, you know, we earlier talked numbers, somebody says, Oh, I got a ten thousand dollar account. If you go to an advisor who charges one percent of your asset base, that means you're paying a hundred dollars a year for their professional advice, their professional input and management. You go, okay, I can pay what I don't know through robo advisor, maybe it's 40, 50, 60, 75 dollars. Don't really know, but I, I'm gonna pay something in there. Um, how much how much difference is there between the robo advisor where I don't really know the cost, but a human I do know and they're charging this number. Is $100 on 10,000 expensive? Is it cheap? And that, again, that's going to be a personal answer for you. Yeah. Investing so is very me, personal. Investing yeah. is about you being in charge and you knowing where you want to go. Even if you're working with an advisor, you're the person driving the boat. So, yeah, you need to know where that is for you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Every question's been good. This is a good Absolutely. Group. Yeah. Alina, we got to blame you for putting together a good group. <laughs> Well, then I have another question. Okay. So uh, I know there are financial advisors and there are financial representatives of financial professionals. What's the difference? <laughs> In some cases, it's a license. In yeah. some cases, it's they're different. They're called a series. And there are some licenses, if you don't have a certain license, you have to be called a financial professional because you're not giving advice because you're not licensed to give advice. If you see someone whose name is financial advisor, that means they have passed a series 66 or a series 65, which allows them to sell their advice either by an hourly cost or by charging for a management fee. Like I said earlier, you find somebody 1%, that's their advisory fee. So if they say financial advisor, they've passed those, those advice giving exams and they're legally allowed to charge for that. A financial professional probably can't, probably has to sell you a commission product, which either they're gonna charge for or they're gonna do for free. Um, so a financial planner is somebody who can be all of those other things and they may charge for building out a plan in the far future, or they may say, well, that's just the name I like. I'll be a financial advisor, but I'll do your planning for you. Any number of financial planners and financial advisors will do very robust financial plans for you without a fee if they're managing your asset. Thank you. Any more questions, anybody? Come on, this is a great opportunity to ask questions. Well, they've done doing a great job. So maybe yeah. we just wore out a lot all the of questions. Good question. I guess the last thing I would say is all of you who are listening, if you would interact with Alina, if there's a topic you would like to explore, like Dr. Turner says, I want to understand more about specific funds and how you guys vet funds when you're doing it. Or if you're saying, I want to understand more about, hey, I got a kid who's going to go to college. How do we fund that? Or I would, Ryan mentioned the term, be my own bank. Explain that. If there are topics that you've heard us touch on or even if you haven't, you're like, I'd like to know more about, please let Alina know that because she can reflect that to us. And when she brings us back on, we can try to address the things that you're interested in. I just put my email into the chat. So if you have any questions, uh, refer them to me and I will refer them to our financial advisors. <laughs> Whatever we are. Yeah. <laughs> financial educators, sorry. Yeah, that works too. There we go. That works too. Well, great, because I definitely want to know how to find the right professional, certified financial professional advisor. And I have a kid who's going to be 16 here in a couple of years. And I'm like, how do I save for a car? So I will save all that for Elena's email. But it's those 
short term things that I'm thinking about as well as like planning for retirement again as a solopreneur what does that look like and what things do I need in place because I don't have the backing of a company so yeah and and so she also has our personal contact and so if you want to reach it she's allowed to give that to you if you want to ask us questions directly feel free to do that too yeah oh here's a question thank you uh, from what you were saying earlier, it is still beneficial to keep putting money into an active 401k while contributions might be higher rather than to move that to an IRA. That's a question. Okay, so if you are at a job and you are using a 401k at work, you stay put. That's the best place for you to put money. It's the cheapest way for you to get it in with the least amount of headache. And if they're matching anything, that's free money. And so you just keep working. You keep doing that. Now, if you've left one time job, two jobs, three jobs, and you have 401ks or plans from previous places, that's when you start going, okay, do I want to drop them into the new plan or do I want to have greater control than IRA? And again, personal preference. And, yeah. and you, we will always say, if you've left, you can always leave it there unless the company kicks you out, which about 20% of the time they'll force you out. Uh, but the rest of them, you can leave it there. Nothing wrong with that. You can take it to your new place. That's all consolidated all in one place. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with saying... I kind of want to have more control and take it to an IRA. So there's benefits to each one of those. Again, very personal, what you want to do, who you trust. The reality is if you're in a 401k or 403b and the company is not big, think uh, more, than, uh, more than 200 employees, you're probably paying more for the service on the 401k than in an IRA. You probably can move the money from a 403b or 401k into an IRA and probably save internal cost. But if you're at a big company, it's probably cheaper sitting there in the 401k. Now, again, you're going to have very, very, very generic, very vanilla investment options, but there's nothing wrong with that. And it's invested and it's got every opportunity to grow. Just matters how much control you want. Yep. Thank you. Oh, did we put up, where do I have a disclosure? Oh, I have it. Yeah, there we go. That's the important slide. That's the one everyone loves to read because it's so exciting. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> I think they're just hungry and they want to go have dinner. Uh, that's, that happens. And I want to ask, who is Broadridge Investor Communication Solutions? So Broadridge is a group that publishes these this kind of slideshow and says these are, they have gone through and, and submitted them to the SEC and FINRA and said, hey, you know, here's the slideshow. Can you approve this? And they say, yes, there's nothing misleading. Yes, go ahead and use that. So Broadridge is a company that publishes slideshows. Yep. So we can use them. We tend to try to create some of our own information whenever possible. Um, but uh, so we have to get it all who, vetted. So. Yeah, that's who Broadridge is. Uh, can people access those slides or is it just for professionals? Um, because this one's got the disclosure in it, theoretically, we we could forward this to you and, and people could peruse it as, as they wish. Yeah. No, I mean, can people go directly to their website oh, and to Broadridge? request? Ah, wow. I, would, I don't know that answer. I would doubt that, but I don't know. I've not tried it. Yeah, because we're not, we're, we're in the professional space. We don't interact like yeah. normal people. <laughs> yeah, no, we're definitely not normal. So, yeah. But you already figured that out. <laughs> Well, not everybody did. Oh, here's another <laughs> question in the chat, I think. No? No, no, no questions. It okay. just showed one, but there is nothing. Okay. All so right. everybody has my email address. You can email me questions if you have any. If you have any future topics you want to talk about, please uh, email me also. And uh, gentlemen, would you provide your information, your contact info, or you want me to give it to them? Well, we can do both. Uh, yeah. So give them, give, email. Give them the email. Yeah. So my email is Matthew with one T, Matthew.bishop at beyondwealthadvisors.com. And mine is Ryan.Hayden, H A Y D E N, at beyondwealthadvisors.com. Those are our emails. And then, yeah. Um, Office numbers, 785-537-4505. Yep, ask for either one of us. 
Well, thank you very much. I understand we don't have any more questions. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, for wonderful presentation. It was great, very informative. And thank you, everyone, for attending this presentation. I'm sure we will have more uh, presentations by Matt and Ryan. So uh, stay tuned. Look at our website. Look at our advertisement. We will have more programs, probably even this summer. If not, then probably in the fall. Right. Well, thank you very much again. Yep. Everybody have a great day. Yep. Yeah. Have Thank a good you. one. Thank you. Bye-bye.